now, I, I know Saturday is a busy day for a lot of things. Ithaca's having brunch fest. I don't know how many more festivals we need. But anyway, um, we have a day filled with poetry. You've come to hear Ben read from uh, Burn Lyrics. So please welcome Benjamin Landry. Thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. I'm going to be reading from this collection, Burn Lyrics, which is uh, roughly structured on, uh, or actually in conversation, I would say, with the translation of Sappho. And um, what we have of Sappho is simply fragments of Sappho. Okay, most of her stuff is written on papyrus, um, and it's disintegrated over the 2,500 years uh, since, since she lived. So all we have are fragments, and um, Ann Carson did a wonderful translation of those fragments in 2003. And um, over the course of reading and rereading Ann Carson's collection, um, I became fascinated with what, not only what, with what was written, but what, what wasn't written. Um, in other words, what was lost to us. Um, and so what I, the, the way I sort of, and I didn't think about this as I was writing it, um, but in reflection, it sort of seems as though, you know, uh, Ann Carson is translating this, these fragments of Sappho, um, and Sappho's narrator is having an experience, and my narrator is also having an experience, and sometimes they intersect, okay? And those intersections are the words that come to us in the fragments. Um, so it's as though they're in like two different dimensions, basically. So I'm going to read uh, a number of poems from Burn Lyrics, and then I'll read some, uh, some that are not in Burn Lyrics, just a few. Um, and then at the end, I'll return to Burn Lyrics. Um, this first poem, the only word that, that remains to us from fragment 190 is many skilled. Okay, that's all we have. Unemployed. The porch may be a graveyard for barbecue grills, strollers, and FedEx packages, but ghosts of suitors still return to the overhead light every evening, many skilled in persuasion, sharp of dress, slick of hair, soft of voice, flowers in a hidden hand. Stray. I've been accused of many things, and sure, I most emphatically came with the privilege of safety, a home that wanted me. But I am nobody's sad face, nobody's nightmare. I'll graze anything. I'll lie down in the flowers and eat the flowers. I am not someone who likes to give away the ending. I'm not someone who. I'm not someone. I've exceeded my tender. And how I wound up over the blue mountains and away from the sleeping village is rather a long story. I tell the circling wolves, nay, and it seems to work. I have a quiet mind. This next one um, is in reference to Odysseus, who I think is not only traditionally one of the greatest heroes of mythology, um, but also one of the biggest jerks. <laughs> The taunting nobody. It's a terrible thing to ask how long you've been this way. To stare into lights is to prefer the world in a veil of purple traces. It's too, too Pentecostal otherwise. It seems to be the rule that anyone asked to get better never does. At least this way, everyone gets to believe in a fantasy of their own making. Like Mary and her boyfriend with delusions. What is it you would like to see today? And with what eyes? You keep. It is absurd. All that time I cowered in the laurel bush next to the house, trying to think of ways to keep. An early Rufus hummingbird sipped water off the points of an English oak tree, and I wondered what it would feel like stilled in the hand but everything sweeter than that, and irresistible red for them. Oh, to be an ounce, a traveler unkept. But I scarcely ever listened to their thrum. It crept up on a soul like the realization one is not beloved, and keeping seems such folly now. And the trick was to arrive kindly, like this dynamo that barely touched down, just as you might have explained that love had got there first. Beautiful and then the clothes you had laid out for it.
feeling lucky. Never felt so lucky. Scent of gasoline coming from the shed, and later resurrection lilies bursting through the tired green. The rule is we can't go to sleep feeling lucky. So we stay up and talk about the dawn, how we may see ourselves changed. Who wants to be wise? Lady sings the blues of whom? Gold arms of morning hold us down, and we wonder if it's the sort of doom we will outlast. First of the season. As though forgetting we're discreet. Something you could lead into a dead end, close the door on. A spotlight follows you through your loneliness follows you through the frozen entree section with your mental list and gleaming metal cart. Someone was singing in the shower, liar, liar, liar. Seems you had a certain chemistry. Pure filth. Let's not sing anymore of pigeons sizing one another up in Washington Square Park, but I to you of a white goat tormented by flies and the rotting fruit just out of reach on the other side of the slatted fence. Later you can describe to me a freeze in pink sugar, and I'll pour wine over it so that we can enjoy its ruin. We'll go away like that someday, all of a sudden, with a burnt electric circus smell in the air, it's disgusting. Herculaneum is the first town that was destroyed in the eruption of Vesuvius in the year 79. So a lot of the recorded papyrus work, some of Sappho's work, but mostly of other, other works, were destroyed in these um, fires. So all that we have now are these fragments. Um, so this, is, this poem is one of the keys to this whole collection. Herculaneum. How like a rapture that pyroclastic downrushing, when before there was the ordinary afternoon, a dog chasing its tail, a woman wringing dye out of cloth, flowers bowing below a hot cloud, like the breath of a child about to gather them up. Messenger. That the cities are on fire must mean little to you in your redoubt of spring. There was a time when I would wake to your ringtone, a recording of a nightingale. If I am with the retinue of your past, now insubstantial, yours is not exactly a voice of reason, your indestructible soul longing. And I think it's the last poem before I do some other poems. Uh, this one is entitled Opening Day, which sort of makes sense um, for this time of year. Opening Day. Pity is not something that keeps you warm in a deer stand. Your hands trembling with cold, as the tongues of flame have been known to tremble, as the side of the deer, the flesh beneath the gold-dusted side trembles at the stiff breaking, at the stiff vein of a leaf breaking in the underbrush. You're perhaps still accurate. You're perhaps less so. By now you've noticed old age creeping into your thoughts. It covers the ground like sedge, like new frost. Something done and white darts in the palimpsest, in the palimpsest of a canopy. A jet at 30,000 feet flies off in pursuit. If there's something noble in this taking, it's hard for you to say. You'd rather have that hypothermic vision, perhaps, of the girl who used to sing to us, the one who didn't get the chance to grow up, the one with violets in her lap. Can you remember how the song goes, how it, in the cracked air, mostly goes astray? Here are uh, three poems, four poems, uh, unconnected to burn lyrics. These are just things that I'm working on now. Peonies. Worth only what is written there, the peonies that are hypnotic to look at, but that emit a not very nice smell while the story of the house has yet to come out, like the denouement of the Salem witch trial, trials, where everyone stands around looking sheepish about how wolfish they have been. 
cut that freshly. Float that in a clean crystal bowl of water. And these next two are um, in response to the war in Syria. This one is uh, about the Temple of Bel, which was destroyed by ISIS, um, Palmyra. If the war ever ends and we are able to walk through it again, we'll have to walk through columns of air beneath architraves of migratory bird song. Here are ruins of blue like letters the dead intended for us. Here a series of cultures spoke in beautiful forms they each recognized in one another, made palimpsests now beneath the message of the historyless extremist fighter, a young man in love only with the pulse of the fuse, the bit of the jackhammer, who on another day forces children from school, sinks a blade in the body of a stranger as though to end once and for all the thing he cannot even recognize, much less destroy in himself. Sugar Maples. Upstate lurid weather whose bursting and rain-bright pavements and columns reinforced and crimson obscure the path if there ever was one Aleppo and this alarming fall string of crisp nights, string of bombardments we are having. Sister, how they are found, unearthed, brother, how they are found, dusted as sandbags, as disks of bread, the inexhaustible fall from which they called down, swung from alleys, hospitals, jungle gyms, settled, now nested, a bright, a brisk wind, an appalling absence of red. Dusk. Heavy rain. I call down to the high school girls gathered in the park looking down. Is something wrong? It's a new birthed fawn not getting up. Its eye is moving, one replies. Several minutes. They try to leave and come back. One of the girls' cell rings, then another. A mother wondering where they've gone. A boyfriend calling from a party. Soon, they say, while the fawn is going where they can't follow. We're back in burn lyrics now. At the county fair, the goat herd is a 4 H'er in fake Western regalia. There's popcorn, sawdust in the air, prized longing, Klieg lights, hat band sweat, animal lowing, racket from the tilt-a-whirl. First place is a $300 scholarship and a laurel wreath with crimson roses. What's a goat herd to do but search for love in the parking lot and the miles of corn beyond that? My darling one, is it time already to put on our shoes and walk across the bridge? In the other direction, coyotes lope toward Golden Gate Park to work on the feral cat population. We don't acknowledge one another, maybe because the light is bad, but maybe something more fundamental. Is it because our languages have so thoroughly diverged? Is it because I imagine you now as I have imagined you all my life? part of my dying mind. I wanted so much to acquaint you with a new city, but the skyscrapers bore you like columns of tears. Still, it was lovely to watch you spear that last pimento. I feel I've gotten that much right, at least. This will be my last poem. Uh, so thank you all for coming and for uh, supporting this independent bookstore and Having lived in a couple of places without an independent bookstore, uh, it's really a wonderful thing, and I hope you all appreciate it so much. Thank you to my family and friends for being here. I appreciate it. The words from this poem are only words taken from Fragment 48, which reads, You came and I was crazy for you, and you cooled my mind that burned with longing. So, Patsy Klein. And you, with my longing, you came burned cooled. 
and mind that I was crazy for you. Thanks. I'm not sure if my questions even make sense, but it's, the poems seem like a puzzle. Hmm. Do you do you move words around when you write them? Do you? I don't construct them in a way that is supposed to be puzzling or ob obfuscating, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's... I don't, I don't mean that they're puzzling. But yeah, they're yeah, I, I know what you're talking about in terms of like some sort of like magnetic poetry sort of thing where you move, move things around. Actually, in most of the poems in that collection, the words from the fragments appear in the same order that they would um, in the original um, work by Sappho. So you could sit there and pick them out. And, and find them um, sort of scattered across the poem in that in that particular order. Um, I think probably the Patsy Klein poem is, um, uh, and maybe one other poem. One other poem uses. I, I think there are two poems that use the same fragment in there, and then the Patsy Klein poem is the only one that uses only the words from from the fragments. Do you work the rest of the poem around those fragments? No, no. No, really, I just, I, I read the poem until I feel like a narrative is happening or some, some sort of a, it, 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 an autonomous poetic thought is happening. Yeah. Yeah. What inspired you to write poetry? Um, this, you mean this particular collection or just in general? Well, just in general, I guess. Uh-huh. Um, I suppose that there's, what? <laughs> It's a, yeah, it's a very simple question, but a very important question. Um, I suppose that it's, <laughs> there, to, some, to some extent, you know, I grew up uh, reading some poetry, but mostly f fiction. And I feel like there is some sort of a, um, of an extra aesthetic sense that is satisfied by poetry that I wasn't getting in just um, music or in, in, you know, prose. Um, it's hard to put a finger on it. It's a flexibility, I suppose, of, of what is possible within the context of a page, <laughs> you know? Um, and I also enjoy, with poetry, there's some, a lot more leeway for, say, things like recursive speech um, or to play with abstraction um, in a way that's, you know, it's, it's accepted. It's, a, it's part of the mode. Yeah. It speaks to reading your poetry aloud. Um, how do you decide how much background information to give on the poem or to, to give any at all? As a reader myself, I always feel um, overwhelmed by, by background information if a poet gives too much. Because what I, I, I'm drawn to the idea of an open text. It's the Barth, uh, Roland Barthes idea of an open text, which is that um, you, as a reader, are creating the book at the moment of reading it. Um, it's a negotiation between you and the author, um, your own pre preconceptions, your own history, and the author's history, and what's going on in culture. That all sort of gets woven into this thing that happens in front of you. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I feel if, if the author gives too much background, that kind of overpowers my own experience of the piece, um, which is why I tend to um, err on the side of less background information, yeah. <laughs> and that can be frustrating, but yeah, I mean, that's why we have question and answer sessions afterwards. I certainly hope that my poems have a life of their own after the reading, so that, you know, you could, you could read it later and get something totally different from my explanation of that poem. Um, because I, I think that's the more truthful way of doing it, because psychologically more goes into the poem than I'm aware of, you know. Um, that, is, that part escapes me and um, you get to create that as a reader. Yeah? I wanted to ask about why Sappho. I mean, mm -hmm. It's very difficult thing to work with mm -hmm. such small pieces. So yeah. What's the draw? <laughs> um, well, the draw was what was not there. I mean, the gaps I found incredibly evocative and freeing. Um, Sappho's, I mean, if you read those poems, you get a sense of the, uh, of desire, uh, narratives of desire. She's writing not only about her own desire, but she was, you know, commissioned to write poems um, and sing sing those poems um, for other people. But they're mostly about desire, 
Um, and I look at those words and I think, what else is going on here? You know, what other what other things are on are, are on the speaker's mind? And that's where the second narrative starts. Um, Sappho, she had she, and obviously an incredibly interesting life. Um, you know, and and what we have of her is only you know it's it's only those two hundred poems. So we have to reconstruct her every time. Um, and I like that puzzle of recon reconstruction. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.